Hi, everyone. On behalf of the Grant Center for the American Jewish Experience and the Africana Studies Program, I want to welcome you to Black, But, and, or Jewish, a conversation on intersections within and across communities. I am Juana McQuinn, the program coordinator of the Grant Center, which empowers innovative research and collaborations within and beyond the academy to advance American Jewish studies and its broader relevance, and is committed to exploring and highlighting the diversity of American Jewish experiences. We are thrilled to have uh, had the opportunity to work with the Africana Studies Program to bring Rabbi Shays Rishon, Rabbi Isama uh, Isa Goldstein Stoll, Kendall Pinkney here with us today. I have the great honor of introducing our moderator, Dr. Mia L. Banneres, Professor of Art, History, and Director of the Africana Studies Department. Dr. Banneres studies and teaches African, African diaspora art history and studies of race in Western art. Much of her scholarship explores the representation of race in the Anglo-American world and the place of images in the histories of slavery, colonialism, empire, and the construction of national identities. She has focused particularly on depictions of mixed race or ambiguously raced bodies that trouble, transgress, and potentially disrupt constructed racial orders by exposing their artificial and often arbitrary foundations. Since 2012, Dr. Bonneris has also been a member of Shir Hadash Conservative Congregation, where she is a regular Torah reader and davening leader, and she has just joined the Advisory Council of Jewish Currents Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mia Bonneris, who will introduce our three panelists and get our conversation started. If you have questions or comments during the program, please put them in the chat. Thank you, Alana, for that generous introduction and also for your amazing work in organizing tonight's discussion. You truly did most of the heavy lifting with the logistics of making tonight happen, and I've really enjoyed working with you. I also want to give a shout out to Africana Studies Program Assistant Rebecca Villapondo for her help in promoting the program as well. On behalf of the Africana Studies Program, I want to welcome all the participants to our conversation this evening, as well as everyone at home who's tuned in to join us. Before we proceed with what I know will be an incredibly engaging discussion, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that I am zooming into you from the ancestral, rightful, and unceded homeland of the Chattayakni or Choctaw and Chittimacha nations, two of many indigenous groups with historic ties to Balbancha, or the place of many tongues, the Choctaw name by which the greater New Orleans area was known before settler colonialism, and which is used by some indigenous people living in the region today. This statement acknowledges that colonialism is not a past event, but an ongoing process of which we are a part. So I'm an art historian, as Alana's introduction will have let you know, not a rabbi or a religious studies scholar or a sociologist or an anthropologist. And this conversation feels quite far afield from my academic wheelhouse. Usually when I take the stage, in this case, a virtual one, as it has been for the last year, for a university sponsored event, I am used to having the armor of my credentials and my research as a sort of protection from the personal nature, um, as a sort of protection that the personal nature of tonight's discussion does not afford me. So I truly struggled with how to compose my opening remarks for this evening. Therefore, before I introduce tonight's amazing panelists in lieu of the traditional sort of academic opening remarks that might precede a discussion such as this one, I just want to tell you a very brief story that I hope will bring into relief some of the topics that we'll address tonight and which I hope our discussants will expand upon uh, by adding their own experiences and ideas during the rest of our time together. Picture it, Coral Springs, Florida, circa 1993. I'm standing in the doorway of a child's bedroom and I hear the question, mommy, is Michal a Schwarze? Fresh from the bath and wearing a long pink nightgown, Chaya Mushka Feldman lay in her toddler bed as her mother stroked her dark curls, still slightly damp, smelling faintly of baby shampoo. And she tucked her in before rushing out to an evening function at the shul. Amplified by her angelic appearance, the dissonance between the innocent cadence of the three-year-old's inquiry and the ugliness behind her question jarred me. Her, I was her regular Mozi Shabbos babysitter, and 
Mushki's curiosity did not simply reflect a toddler's natural observation of difference. She did not, for example, merely ask why my skin was brown and hers white. Instead, her query revealed that already at that tender age of three, she had learned to invest racial difference with racist significance. Therefore, my presence in her world as a Black person who did not conform to what she had been taught about Black people required explanation. She looked to her mother to make my very existence intelligible. Khani Feldman blanched, clearly embarrassed by her daughter's question, but quickly supplied a response that to her mind, I am sure, put the matter to rest. Don't be silly, Mushki, she said. Michal, that is my Hebrew name, is one of us. As I stood in the doorway of Mushki's bedroom in my oh-so-fashionable 90s teenage girl uniform, long straight denim skirt from The Gap, striped rugby shirt from Aeropostale, and Chuck Taylors on my beat, for a split second, Rebitson Feldman's answer comforted me, confirming my status as an insider, as someone who truly belonged, a real Bas Melech, a daughter of the king. However, as the night wore on and I sat in the kitchen finishing my homework under the watchful eyes of the Rebbe, whose picture was in every room of the house, I realized the entirely unsatisfactory nature of the Rebitson's response. Her answer did nothing to disturb her daughter's sense of the world a world in which black people were Schwarzes and Schwarzes were bad. It simply explained the phenomenon of my existence by negating my blackness entirely. For Rebitson Feldman, my us-ness superseded my them-ness. In her eyes, my Jewish neshama rendered the fact of my blackness, if not invisible, at least possible to overlook. It occurred to me that Hani Feldman had never seen me for who I truly was, Jewish and Black, for her putting these two identities together was incomprehensible. For me, however, it is not optional. While Schwarze is, a fortu is fortunately not a term with which I find myself confronted on a regular basis, this anecdote brings into graphic relief something I encounter regularly as I negotiate my Jewish identity uh, and my Jewish life even today, a tendency to pretend that because I am Jewish, my blackness doesn't matter. And if I had a shekel for every time someone has told me, oh, I totally forgot you were black, or even worse, oh, I didn't mean you. This colorblind approach, while well-intentioned, denies not only a rich history and culture and tradition that shape who I am, but also the very real way in which race informs my existence in the manner in which I move through the world every day. In a world in which African Americans can be murdered in their own church or while taking a morning run or while, while doing just about anything, simply for being Black, Blackness matters. And my Blackness matters to me just as much as my Jewishness. I want to be regarded as wholly myself, Black and Jewish, proudly, insistently, adamantly, both. And a queer feminist vegan former cheerleader, but that is a story for another day. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the volume way down on my own voice and invite the voices of tonight's panelists to do most of the talking, sharing their own experiences of intersecting Black and Jewish identities and their ideas about how Black Jews can be supported in bringing their full selves, all of their intersecting and overlapping identities to every table at which they sit. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage tonight, Rabbi Shays Rishon, perhaps better known by his pen name, Manish Tana, who is an author, writer, educator, playwright, rabbi, and public speaker, whose work on racial and religious identity and culture and how their intersections manifest in America takes prejudice, bias, and ignorance head on, asking questions about humanity, race, religion, and social injustice that we all have and maybe are afraid to talk about. He does so with gut-punching insight and gut-busting sarcasm. A recipient of the Jewish Week's 36 Under 36 Award in 2014, he has contributed to the Jewish Daily Forward, Tablet Magazine, Hevria, and is the author of three books on Jewish and African-American identity. His debut novel, Ariel Sampson, Freelance Rabbi, was a finalist for the 2018 National Jewish Book Award for debut fiction. Rabbi Izama Goldstein Stoll is the senior Jewish educator at the Joseph Slifka Center for Jewish Life at Yale University, 
Rabbi Goldstein Stoll earned her BA in religious studies from Carleton College before pursuing an MA in Hebrew letters and rabbinical ordination from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati. She has been deeply shaped by the reform movement, but has also served conservative and humanistic congregations and has provided pastoral services in a variety of social service settings and landlocked states. Through her work at B'Kol Ishon, an organization dedicated to serving Jews of color, Rabbi Goldstein Stoll has served as an advocate around issues of Jewish diversity, and she is dedicated to using her work to help Jewish institutions foster inclusive environments where Jews of all identities feel included and affirmed in their diversity. And finally, soon to be Rabbi Kendall, uh, Kendall Pinkney is a Texas born, Brooklyn based theater maker, Jewish life consultant, and rabbinical student at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where I believe he is the first student of African descent. Named one of Jewish Week's 36 Under 36 in 2017, he is a founder and associate producer of Kaleidoscope Jews, a troupe of storytellers who relate the experiences of Jews from various non Ashkenazic, non white backgrounds. In addition to his creative work, he is the rabbinic intern for the Jewish Arts and Culture Organization's Reboot and Laba, and serves on the spiritual direction team at Amud, the Jews of Color Torah Academy. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists to the virtual stage. Uh, and I will clap since uh, to break the awkward webinar silence. Just gonna clap for you all in place of the folks who I know are clapping at home. So let's get into it, shall we? Now that I've introduced each of you, I'd like to actually give you all the opportunity to introduce yourselves a bit more personally, uh, emphasizing the things that you most want the folks tuning in at home to know about you and or your work and your primary commitments. Um, and I'm just going to go in the order that you all appear on my screen. So I'll start uh, with Manish Chana. <laughs> I, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and hi, guys. Uh, Rabbi Shesh Rishon. Um, also known as the uh, troublemaker known as Manish Chana across various social medias. You can find me Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, improbably, but there I am. Um, uh, so I guess I've been uh, writing and speaking on uh, racial and religious identity and how the intersections tend to manifest in American Judaism for uh, a little bit over a decade now. But uh, I also do fun things like. Um, I'm a huge blurred. I, I love me some anime. Uh, uh, really excited for uh, Shang Chi coming out. So those kind of regular things, and I don't know. I guess I think it's important to show the rest of us in our fullness. Like we often, I guess, get bisected into these uh, just these segments. Or I, I believe you said, Doctor B, something about uh, being reduced to titles uh, when you're sort of in these spaces. So. We're full people and hopefully throughout the course of this conversation, you get to see us as actual people in a room having a conversation with each other and hoping the world change for the better after it. Great, thank you so much. Kendall. Well, uh, this is uh, such a pleasure to just be with this lovely group. Um, and especially my brother, Rabbi Chase Rishon, the OG, my goodness. This is wild, I can't believe here we are so many years later. Um, so yes, I'm Kendall Pinkney, almost rabbi. I have one year left at uh, JTS um, where I will be an ordained rabbi and also have my master's in Midrash. Um, beyond being a rabbinical student though, my background is in the arts as a playwright, musical theater writer, and um, also kind of dramaturge. So in fact, I would say a lot of my work actually focuses on working with artists. And I've recently in the last year of us kind of being inside of our homes and having lots of chances to rewrite our resumes and this, that, and the third came to the conclusion that the title that describes my work is rabbinic dramaturge. So I often get together with artists, many artists who would describe themselves as artists who happen to be Jewish um, and also Jewish artists of color, get into a room. Often we kick around ideas. I will bring some of the traditions of 
our um, heritage, uh, textual traditions, rabbinic traditions, and see, let's, let's throw this all at the wall and see what sticks, see how we can find really interesting ways to get into some trouble um, with the text by being both reverent and irreverent. So that takes up a lot of my time, uh, meeting with artists, meeting with Jews of color, and often meeting with Jews of color who happen to be artists. So that I would say even my whole approach to doing work around race and justice really is through the arts and through storytelling, which I believe is the most underutilized um, tool and quite possibly the most powerful tool. So that's a, enough of a start for me. That's a terrific start. And uh, let's close out the start uh, with Rabbi Isama. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, guess, I don't know if I'm as, as exciting as, as the rest of you guys. Uh, I spend okay. most of my time in in one on one conversations with college students and really kind of have a, a passion for pastoral care and relationship building and uh, pretty big book nerd also. Uh, I'd say my my interests are mostly in uh, Jewish philosophy, a lot of Martin Buber, uh, and also in Jewish medical ethics. Uh, so that's that's how I spend most of my time. Uh, but it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Also, uh, I don't know if we used our pronouns, shared those yet, but I use uh, she/her pronouns. Um, yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. And as the mother of uh, a, a child that I'm sending off to college in the fall, I appreciate that you have those one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, with college students most of the day. Um, and indeed, I, as, as somebody who's a, about to send a black Jewish kid off to college who, who wrote a lot about that in his college essays, um, I, I, I think about this idea of, of bringing your story right to the the institutions that you interact with and how he will bring his story um to his college experience um and uh kendall brought up this idea of, of storytelling as one of the most powerful ways that we can um engage with these issues so to just to get us started i'm going to ask you to tell me your just one of your funniest or least funny stories um that Reveal, reveal something about your experience of being Black and Jewish that conveys some of either the joys and or challenges of your intersectional identity. And feel free to bring other intersectional identities uh, to, the, to the table as well. I believe I qualify for every single uh, of the diverse things that are my synagogue welcomes in its statement of best principles. Black, Jew by choice, <laughs> queer, disabled I'm all of these things so um just tell me what if, tell me tell, tell me a story that relates something about the joys and challenges of how you experience your identity in the spaces that you interact in and I'm not gonna dictate the order so whoever wants to jump in I am not going first <laughs> I already shared my story I mean I could share another one but I'm turning the volume down on my voice. I'll go ahead and um, start with something then. Um, oh, goodness. This is actually, this is less of a story that took place inside of a Jewish setting or even uh, a specifically like Black setting. Rather, it was just quite possibly the weirdest story of someone discovering that I was Black and Jewish. Um, so I went to NYU for my master's of fine arts. And one day I was going to a rehearsal or coming from a rehearsal because it was late. And I'm walking near New York University and this person, this, this brown man starts yelling at me. He's like, hey, you, you come here, come here. I'm a little terrified. Uh, so I'm thinking, should I run? But for whatever reason, I don't run and I go to him and he starts um, speaking very, very quickly. And he's like, I could tell that you, you know, I could tell that you were my brother. I could, I think I heard you speaking French, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. And then he starts revealing that um, this was around the time of the um, Charlie Hebdo um, um, incident in France. And so this young man was like, uh, I'm afraid of being targeted. I'm actually Muslim. I just cut off my beard. My mother 
um, is scared in Paris. And I could just, I, I could tell like you were my brother and da, da, da. And so he starts going on and on about like feeling like he's being profiled among other things. And then I pull my cap off of my head, revealing my kippah and he's like, and then he, so at first he's just like, what? And then he puts his hand on top of my head and my kippah and he's like, I love the Jews. And then he <laughs> gives me this huge hug. And it was just such a weird experience of like, he thought that I was for whatever reason, like a, a French speaking Muslim man um, who could relate to him. And then I reveal my Jewishness and he's like, well, I love you and gives me this big hug. And it's just, it was a weird sense of like, we are connecting in a moment where goodness knows this is a weird way to connect. Um, and yet also it's obvious that he wanted to be seen as he is. And then I revealed who I was and he saw that and acknowledged it. It was really weird, really beautiful. I, it's still one of my favorite life experiences of my New York decade thus far. That that is indeed a beautiful story. I love the idea of like him wanting to reach out to you for one reason, and then you found a way to connect, um, even though the reasons were different. Right? Absolutely. Uh, anybody else want to share a story? All right. All right. Um, um, oh, I'm, of course. I'm yeah, sure. uh, you know, it's it's a little challenging to to find stories that are like not so traumatic and are lighthearted enough to not feel like they're going to kill the mood. Um, but I will I will share maybe actually two very quick stories. Uh, one, the confusion maybe internally from the Black Jewish side, uh, and the other, uh, you know, more from the outside. Um, the one from the inside actually took place in New Orleans uh, after Katrina. We went down to visit some family in their FEMA trailer. We're sitting there on the floor in the FEMA trailer. Uh, and my great grandmother is uh, telling my, my siblings and I the story about my, my name. And she's like, I was named after my great great grandmother, the first person in the family to be born out of slavery. So you're sitting here telling the story. And my three year old brother, who's you know, grown up in like Jewish, exclusively Jewish spaces his whole life is sitting there looks like, oh, you know, Pharaoh. So that was <laughs> a good perception yeah. of, of Black Jewish identity there. Um, but I'll say on the more traumatic side, I think a lot of experiences in congregational settings, whether it's, you know, walking in and having Jewish identity questioned or, you know, standing on the Bima on the high holidays and giving uh, Devar Torah and really feeling like you've given it your all. And then at the end, like the first person that comes up is like, Rabbi, uh, quick question. Are you an Igoroid? Uh, so. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that technology. That is some Ooh. some trauma. Um, that that I think trumps some of my my uh, more interesting interactions, especially walking into a congregation that that I'm not familiar with or that doesn't know me, um, which is I think always uh, a challenging experience uh, for me. I don't know about for you, but I was taking my son to a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah actually, that we drove 1600 miles to get to or something like that. It was the bat mitzvah's best friend from camp. And um, as soon as I walked into Friday night services, I could just feel a pair of eyes on me. Um, and I looked in the corner and Sky was staring at me the whole time. And it was a very large shul and he crossed the room, like uh, crossed a lot of people, very crowded bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah to tell me, you, you knew all the words. You dobbined really well. <laughs> and I was like, thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, I knew all the words. Um, I feel like that's a more lighthearted, uh, a more lighthearted story. Uh, but you're right, there, there can be trauma involved and there can be the sense that you need to announce who you are all the time, even like before you, before you get to a place. I remember moving to a different city and calling the Chabad rabbi and asking like where I could like is there like how to how where the Chabad was like how do how do I walk here from my from where I am and he was like oh you just come stay by me stay by us and 
you know, I dropped some names. He, I knew the right people. He knew I wasn't, you know, a crazy person from off the street. And I walked to the door. My mom actually drove me. I was a high school senior. My mom drove me to his house, dropped me off. And the first words out of his mouth were, Michal, you're black. And I was like, indeed, I am. And I was like, what was, at what point was the proper juncture in all of our many conversations, like, you know, with, with my wife, or with his wife, rather, to say, oh, and by the way, I probably don't look like what you're expecting. Um, but they did let me in, and I had a nice weekend. Um, do you want to share a story, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Rishon? I'm feeling prodigious regret that I didn't go first. Uh, <laughs> all of those stories. Um, I, I had two stories in mind, but uh, you reminded me of two other stories. Um, first one, I don't understand that thing when you're in like a new shul, synagogue, whichever space, and you know they, they call you up to the beam and like open you know the aron or whatever. Because there's always this one guy, at least for me, that does the same thing. Ha! Oh, amazing, you're hired. Like what are you? Why are you <laughs> that I'm, I've mastered simple levers and pulleys like I don't understand what what am I being hired for is this an actual position here like I don't I don't understand what's going on um the second story that your second story reminded me of was when um the week before the week of um my oofroof my wife and I had friends of ours uh, who lived I think in Queens come over uh to stay in Mill Basin you know at Chabad you know the Chabad house said oh just go to this house da, 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 da. and like, I don't remember if they let them in or not, <laughs> because like, oh, hmm. you're not what I expected, you know, to look like. So now when we make sort of arrangements, we sort of, or at least my wife does, I'm stubborn. Uh, she makes her say, well, they're, we're not going to look like, or they aren't going to look like. Um, so that's ridiculous. Um, as the stories that I was going to tell, I have tons of trauma stories. I'm sure they'll come out over the course of this conversation. Um, but there's sort of two humor-ish ones. Uh, one I remember from high school. Like I grew up Orthodox uh, Chabad, but I went to, me and my siblings went to public school because sending a black child to Chabad in the 80s is a terrible idea. And we grew up in and around Crown Heights before, during, and after the riots. So fun times. So public school it was. Uh, so in high school, I was in the next day after Purim. And you know, there were a lot of like, you know, Jews, they were varying different observance styles. Uh, and we'd all been out the day before for purring. So it's math class and, you know, non-Jewish, like white Italian teachers going down the line to, oh, I was up for purring, I was up for purring, I was up for purring. He comes to me and he has this night. So Chase, were you also out for the Jewish holiday? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and there was a, oh, a and went on. And the second one, I don't have a lot of stories of, you know, black anti-Semitism as I do uh, white Jewish racism in Jewish spaces. Uh, but this is a weird occurrence. I was getting off work uh, from my old junior high school in Crown Heights, standing at the bus stop, and this lady apparently had ordered too much chicken and asked me if I wanted some. And the entire interaction was just so bizarre that I brain fartered and I said, uh, I can't have it, it's, it's not kosher. And she said, it's just chicken, motherfucker. And <laughs> there's that. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, um, you know, it's interesting that I, I'm glad you brought up this sort of sense of, of ex experiencing potential anti-Semitism from the Black community or experiencing racism from, uh, from, the, from the white Jewish community. I know that for me, um, my experiences as part of the Black community are, are, are more numerous simply because more of my family identifies as Black than as Jewish. Um, but a, a comforting kind of funny, but also really kind of trivializing story is that my grandmother who had difficulty raising, like she just never understood me. She's a very Catholic woman or was a very Catholic woman. Um, but was just overjoyed when I embraced any religion whatsoever because I was, my parents are apparently heathens um, who just raised me to be open uh, to, to all religions and think everyone was great. Um, and uh, she was like so happy when I, not only when I embraced Judaism, but when I was like really deep into it. Um, and 
she was, but she was upset that I couldn't eat any of the food that like, I'm from New Orleans, you know, shrimp etouffee is like where it's at. Uh, and she taught me how to cook some things and substitute for tofu, but she was also really upset that she could never feed me when I came to her house, which is just something that black Southerners do. When you come to their house, they want to feed you. So she had a box of matzah in her house at all times. It did not matter what, what time of the year it was. It's December. Here, Mia, have some matzah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and a way in which she tried to express her love for me, even through her kind of her 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 limited knowledge of the place that I was coming from. So I guess my my it's, it, we seem to have we be kind of vacillating between the heavy territory and the lighter territory. And so I'm just going to get into some of the heaviness for a little bit, and then maybe we'll end on a lighter on a lighter note. Um, over the last year, the mobilizations for justice that emerged following the murder of George Floyd have certainly brought us to a moment of racial reckoning. Um, and increased awareness of anti-Black racism has prompted many of our white friends to take personal stock. Meanwhile, all sorts of institutions, including universities, synagogues, and other Jewish institutions, institutions have been prompted to respond to amplified calls for equity, diversity, and inclusion. So speaking from your own personal experience or the work that you've been doing um, with uh, uh, Jews of color communities, what guidance would you give our white Jewish allies personally and our schools and other Jewish institutions in their efforts to promote anti-racism and to support Jews of color? I heard a deep sigh. <laughs> I have a feeling that in the weeks following George Floyd's murder, probably all, all four of us maybe, or at least three of us, uh, received a lot of calls. Oh, can you come speak? Can you come to my Jewish organization? Can you be on my board? And I think um, first and foremost, understanding that it's not like a one second fix having a Jew of color speak in your Jewish organization isn't gonna change, you know, a entire history of deeply ingrained systemic racism. Uh, and I think the places that I've seen doing the work really well are places where folks are willing to look inside and really try to examine their own internal biases and um, try, to, try to move forward in like the, the small personal kind of uh, tissue roll way. I would definitely like to piggyback off uh, what Rabbi Goldstein Saul said about it's not a one-off. Um, I think part of the problem is this question is that it has to be asked is because there are no relationships that are in place. Like the answer to all of these is to be in relationship because when you're in relationship with somebody, you don't necessarily need to ask or you know to ask and you know to you know, actually listen to what the answer is. Like, like, what can we do? You can do this. Oh, what if I do this? That's great. Not what I needed, not what I asked. Um, and that works, I think, both on the uh, macro organization level and in the micro interpersonal level. And I, to speak even more to the interpersonal level, everyone's gone to junior high school, okay? We know that's awful. We hated it. We know what it's like to be othered just from that experience alone. And we know how we would have appreciated administration to reach out to us, how we would have wished other students had supported us, or how our teachers were there for us. And to take that same empathy, that same, you know, 12 or 13 year old that we never really grew out of because no one leaves high school and just apply that empathy on one and that macro interpersonal level and then upwards to an organizational level. Like as an organization, you know when things happen to Jews, how you would have wanted organization to show up, what statements you would have wanted them to say, how soon you wanted them to say it, how forceful, how behind you, how like in between, you know all those problems that you wouldn't want if it was a Jewish issue. So take that same approach and apply it to everyone else because every issue is a Jewish issue because Jews are a multinational, multi-ethnic people. Stop and frisk affects Jews. Immigration laws affects Jews. Racial profiling affects Jews. So when you look at it that way, as opposed to, oh, it's us as Jews with our Jewish values patting ourselves on the back because we're helping those, or those communities over there. 
this this issue over there. It's not because the Jew, it affects Jews that are sitting in your pews. And again, to come back to get to that point, you have to be in a relationship. Absolutely. I, I mean, that's my answer to everything whenever I get these questions about how to change. Like one thing that I encourage a lot of Jewish communities that happen to be white uh, to do is move away from this notion of best practices and one pagers. Like you want to solve it with best practices and a one pager, it's not going to happen. Like it really is about the relationship. You're going to mess up. So get past that fear of, oh my goodness, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to offend someone. Okay, you might. And I might let you know that you have messed up. But guess what? If we're in relationship, um, there is a lot of leeway and a lot of like grace, so to speak, that is extended to someone messing up because, you know, I love my friends. And if they mess up and I tell them like, we have that, that relationship developed. Um, one thing that I also, being in certain Jewish spaces where I've heard certain leaders complain about feeling like they have to be reactive to everything that's happening. And that's a real, that's a real thing. I get it. Like that sense of, okay, there's just too much stuff happening and I can't be thoughtful if I need to immediately react with the right thing on Twitter or um, this, that, and the third. I actually think it's perfectly fine to take a little bit of time to collect your thoughts. But the one thing that I really dislike is someone either very reflexively writing a boilerplate statement uh, about something that has really, you know, that affects people of color or someone coming in late and writing something that is like insufficient, that is also boilerplate. It's interesting that even for those places that might take a little bit longer to react, so many of the responses are boilerplate. So I would say it's fine to take your time to really be thoughtful about putting out a statement or something like that, but actually be thoughtful and actually do something and think about the ways that you can commit to very specific actions, even if that is the specific action of building communal relationships. But as um, Rabbi Rishon said, it's, it's really all about relationships. Uh, I can attest to the fact that even the art historians got in on the game. So it was all four of us. Um, <laughs> more <laughs> invitations this year than ever. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing that uh, I think that you all brought up is this idea of, of the sense of, of reacting to the current moment. And I'd just like to add that if you are, if you are proactive in a sense, there's no need to be reactive. So that these you know, it shouldn't be about writing a statement in reaction to something that happens. But if you begin, as you know, as Rabbi Rishon pointed out, to build relationships, if you're actually interested in meeting, you know, these issues in a in a thoughtful and meaningful way, as opposed to just being able to put out a statement or have it look like you did the right thing, then you know that work is longer and harder and 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 requires putting in the effort and the work now so that when the thing that happens inevitably happens that you want to react to right you have already been doing the work right that you are the, and that that work can't be work that just is a reaction to a moment in time or an incident it has to be it has to start immediately it should have started a long long time ago and be work that you're continuing to do regardless of, of you know, what is in the news at the current moment. And not be, I think also what you said, Kendall, about not being in a hurry. I feel like so much of what our institutions are doing right now, um, I'm speaking less from the, perhaps from the Jewish institution perspective, but you could tell me if it was, if it was accurate from the Jewish institutional perspective right now, but at least universities are sort of like, we got to put this together real quick. Like, where's our EDI initiative? And, and, you know, it's up on the website the next day, but it's not necessarily particularly well considered or, um, you, you know, not necessarily going to, to fix the problems or result or or really engage the issues that need to be engaged, right? It's all kind of performative. I don't know if that's something that you've experienced in your Jewish communities as well. I, I would like to hop on that uh, a little bit. Um, 
one coming back to that whole junior high school thing like uh Kendall said if you're showing up late if you're, if you're handing your work late it better be amazing um <laughs> that's essentially what, what it comes down that's to literally my late assignment <laughs> policy you can have an extension how long do you need to make it an a <laughs> exactly love it um uh but even ah my train of thought just escaped me um what were we just talking about you were saying if you're going to hand in something late don't yeah it better be good right um <laughs> thank you so coming back to that sort of rapid response people just uh, jump out and institutions need to get these things together throw a panel together um but then those same communities always have this same question this question is always you know part of the panel how do we do this how can we make more welcoming and that's sort of you know a symptom of how hastily put together these panels tend to be. I've spoken on panels that I should not have ever at all. Like, why am I here, you know, in in Kentucky? There, there are no Jew of color voices in Kentucky. Why am I in, you know, there's St. Louis. You know, why am I in Texas? Because it's that quick work. Oh, here's a voice, let's throw them on the panel. And the work needs to be done to look in your, your voices in your communities or in your neighborhoods or in your backyards or in your towns or in your state. Absolutely. And the reason that progress never seems to happen, you never reach out to those people. So those roots never build. You're building roots with some random guy over in New York, flies in, talks to you, think you've solved racism. And then you're wondering, oh, why doesn't this work? Because you didn't, you, like you took a plant, you potted it somewhere else and it's not the soil that it needs. And so until there's less of maybe all of us in just grouped in as you know the Justice League that always comes in on all these kind of panels and talks, you know the names, the same 12 or 20 names, very rarely are we called out for regional specific things that are actually our background, that we do have grassroots in. And that's the other sort of part of this work. Look in your backyard, build with those people. They know what your community needs. They're your community. They know how they need to be reached out to. They're your, they live with you. They, they can give you the most intimate and accurate information than I ever could coming in randomly from some other state. You know, I think one of the, the most challenging things there is it's not reaching out, but actually listening with humility also. And I, I mean, I think a lot of my work through Bechol shown we're serving mostly Jews of color who aren't affiliated with Jewish organizations because they feel like they've been, you know, burned in the past. And uh, I talk with a lot of leaders of Jewish organizations who are like, oh, well, you know, we tried to be welcoming and nobody came or, you know, we talked to that one black Jew and then like, he didn't come back. What's wrong with us? You know, like we're, we're audaciously hospitable is like the term that, <laughs> use, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I think that there, there has to be some, some humility also. Absolutely. Uh, hospitable. I love that. That was a deep cut. That was a deep yeah, cut. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, um, and in this thing, like the 12 to 20 people who get asked to do the same things over and over, like it, in this past year in particular, as was mentioned, we've been asked to do more things than ever. Um, I honestly just started saying no to each and every um, conservative synagogue or conservative affiliated um group because I'm a JTS student or beyond where it was very obvious they were wanting me to come in for a one-off and there wasn't any infrastructure being built to actually develop relationships locally. Um, the conservative movement in particular is really good at um, sitting on its laurels, resting on its laurels with respect to referencing back to uh, Heschel and Martin Luther King Jr. being friends, marching together and things like that. But the beautiful the, photograph. Did but, you know that Abraham you, Joshua Heschel marched at Selma? Are you, are you, you aware know? of that? Did, did, did you know? Um, but it's like, and that's one of the things that when I got asked to write a little bit of, for something during an MLK uh, celebration thing, I was like, I need to get something off of my chest. Um, so I ended up writing a little piece that was like, where have you been since Selma? because the number of times that my parents, my parents are Christian, um, the number of times that when my parents have been in like an interfaith meeting with um, uh, Jews who happen to be white and things like that, and there's always some kind of hortatory comments about like, well, Heschel and King and da da da. And the times I would just see my mom just being like, hold up, who's this one person who marched with thousands of others and Dr. King? Like, 
who like why do they keep talking about this person and so i've been very passionate about saying to my administrators at jts like this is great i love heschel i love heschel's writings all of these things but if we can only point back to heschel um you know and we can only point back to selma then we failed like it has to be in the here and the now and what we do the relationships we build um, and what kind of future we're trying to create. Yeah, you can't keep spending money from an account. You put it money in 70 years ago and didn't add anything new in. <laughs> There's nothing left in that account. <laughs> I, I am so curious, like every Martin Luther King's birthday we hear about Heschel. How many people know what day Heschel was born? Like, <laughs> Very few. <laughs> I don't. I know yeah. every January 15th, here he comes. <laughs> right. Well, you know, next time on Heschel's birthday, we can be like, did you know Martin Luther King? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. That is, that's brilliant. Um, I think that, you know, everyone here has brought up a really, a, a point that I want to relate to this idea that like, you know, people are, are calling you from Kentucky and Nebraska and wherever. Um, and yet, we are all members of congregations, as you said, uh, Rabbi Risho, there are Jews in your pews that you could turn to and be like, you know, how, how can we support you or how can we show up for you? What You are the expert on what it's like to be Black and Jewish here, <laughs> um, as opposed to necessarily bringing in the Black Jewish intelligentsia um, to, to weigh in. On, on these questions. And yet I think for, uh, though I, I feel like this is, I, I've seen it changing in my own lifetime, uh, for a lot of people, they are the only ones in their congregation. It might be one family or it might be, you know, two kids, you might, you might be, you know, the only person. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested to hear um, how you suggest synagogues and institutions navigate, you know, uh, th those, those dynamics when there might not be, you know, a group of people that they can call upon. I feel like that often puts that one person or that one family on the spot. I have been that person. Um, <laughs> um, and in, in a way that's also not necessarily uh, advisable. And I want to connect that to something that Kendall has been saying throughout this conversation, uh, which I feel like comes through in, in the work that I know of, of um, you, Rabbi Aizama, and, and also of you, Rabbi Rishon, this idea of Jews who happen to be white, right? That maybe changing the idea of what we think of as Jewish in the first place or, or what, it, you know, what being Jewish looks like. Um, I have a t-shirt or my son has a t-shirt actually that says this is what a feminist looks like and I'm wondering like maybe I should just have a t-shirt that said this is what a Jew looks like. Um, that changing the face of who we think of as, as being Jewish and part of our communities um, is, is, an important, uh, is an important initiative that, that we could um, take on. I remember standing outside of Harvard Yard and watching the Chabad rabbi, like ask everybody who it was, but right before Purim, he was giving out Mishlo Achmanot, being like, are you Jewish here? Are you Jewish here? <laughs> um, and you know, here I am in my long skirt and my long sleeves and uh, just watching the whole thing happen. And finally I went up to him and it was like, Hak Purim Samea. <laughs> and it's like, how did you know that? Where did you learn that? It was like I was, he thought I was a spy. <laughs> and then we realized we had pe new people in common and things like that. And it was like I had to prove my credentials before I could even have a conversation. So I guess that's two tests or two questions. It's kind of like the, the test of Jewishness, which I feel like, depending on what kind of uh, congregation you are, they're, they're different tests. But leading to a question of like, how do we get rid of these tests? How do we change the face of who kind of is accepted as a, as being just kind of a representation of what, what being Jewish is? So we have 40 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. we, we have another 24 <laughs> minutes in this conversation. We have all the time, all the time. 
Well, I feel like you all go about doing that in different ways. Kendall, your work in theater, Manish Chana, your work in, in writing. And then I frankly, so I find your work, a lot of your work so humorous in the way that you engage with that. Um, so I guess I'm, I'd be interested in hearing the different avenues that we that we might take to, to making this happen. Sure, I, I mean, starting, I always art, art is the thing for me. Um, and if you haven't bought Rabbi Rishon's book yet, please do, it is hilarious. I mean, it's written many books, um, but yeah, like art is the way in because one of the things that's so challenging to developing relationships um, is most human beings live by that notion of no new friends once they get past college or something like that. So it can be hard to develop um, new friendships in adulthood, but I think that finding ways to access art that expresses the complexity of Jewish realities and Jewish experiences is a key way to like start to step into some other experiences and change some of the assumptions around Jewishness. To use just one very small example that was very popular this past year, um, a lot of people were really digging like David Diggs, like a, I want a puppy for Hanukkah. Well, David Diggs did something very, very subversive in there. Do you notice how many children of color? Like all of those children are practically like children of color inside of that video. Why? Because it's like, David Diggs is like, it's Berkeley, man. Like these are the people who I grew up with who were also Jews. Um, so really thinking about art and thinking about art as a way into conversations and relationships I found that it frees us up and lets our shoulders lower about having a debate and to really like actually see to the core of something and be able to talk about, you know, the, the real truths that lie beneath these services that feel so fraught. So yeah, I'll always go back to art um, as a way of getting into that. You know, and I would say even art when it comes to like the posters that you have on the wall in your religious school, do you have different representations of what Jews look like and not just Ethiopian Jews, but like really all of the Jewish diversity? So, yeah, I think art, art is powerful. Is it reflected on your websites too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Co-sign with art, I mean, I do art, I'm an author, it's all in, in the realm of you know creativity. Um, but I guess separate from the medium of art, what first needs to be tackled is whiteness in Judaism as a concept and a construct. And to sort of divest it from whiteness equaling a, an inherently negative you know, value judgment. Like, oh, you're white and Jewish. Like, oh, you're saying I have all these you know, historical, no, we're just saying you glow in the dark, dude. That's, that's all we're saying. Like, <laughs> Like white passing, happen to be white. white that, that's all as ridiculous to me as if I said, I'm not black, I'm Jewish, I'm black passing. Yeah, I, have, I, I have provisional black privilege. And until that conversation is had, then questions like, are Jews white will continue to be asked because who's asking that question? I'm not asking that question. Rabbi, Rabbi Goldstein, are you asking that question? You know, you, Dr. B, are you asking that question? Like. So the people that are asking that question are inherently answering the question. The question is, are white Jews white? And the answer to that question is yes, because whiteness is a spectrum. There's not a fixed point of whiteness that is you know, the whiteness. When you talk about white privilege, there's only one class that has full white privilege, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heterosexual males, that's it. But LGBTQ white people have white privilege, white women have white privilege, white Catholics have white privilege because it's on a spectrum. When it comes to Jews who are white, yes, Jews are white. But to say you don't have privilege is like saying, I have one eye. I don't have sight privilege because people with two eyes can see better than I can. So I can't see at all. I don't have sight privilege. But you're talking to people who have no eyes. So that's the spectrum that's there. No, and I, I actually think that might be a place where the different movements we represent within Judaism also are going to address that question differently or struggle with that in different ways. I think for a lot of reformed Jews, right? There's not really a commitment to halakha. There's not necessarily even a commitment to like a regular Shabbat practice or liturgy or anything. Your Jewish identity is really uh, social justice. 
and tikkun olam. And so if all of a sudden the call for social justice is to look at yourself as less than a perfect hero that never has any biases and is always repairing the world, that's going to be destabilizing uh, in like a really profound way. Uh, and I think the goal there also is for Jewish organizations to, to hold people through that and to be okay with the discomfort until we can figure out how to move past it. I think even from a clergy perspective, like we tell people to like, you know, read and, you know, find yourself in the verses. That doesn't mean you're the hero all the time. It doesn't mean you're always Moses. It doesn't mean you're always a Jew. Sometimes you're Pharaoh. Yeah. Sometimes you're the Egyptians. Sometimes you're the Babylonians. Sometimes you're Esau. And accurately read the text and see yourself there too. Absolutely. And I mean, it's one of the hardest things to do because we all want to see ourselves as heroes when we can. And yet this investment in um, white Jewish, like this whiteness and this Jewishness, it, for me, it actually gets to this um, word that I really hate. And that word is authenticity. I hate the word authentic, especially when it is applied to human beings. I like it when it's applied possibly to a piece of art. I'll let the art historian say uh, if she has a problem with um, authenticity used in that context. But when we're talking about human beings, like what does it mean to be authentically black or authentically Jewish? The number of times I have heard, um, I've heard it used in so many ways, but either, oh, an authentic Judaism looks like this. And I'm like, okay. And I mean, this is the JTS coming out, I'm like, Actually, that is the Judaism of the 15th century, and it's particularly located in like this part of the Iberian Peninsula. So is that what you mean? Um, or I've heard people be like, when I've said, okay, we need to address matters around race um, and class, class is big. Um, and for people to say like, well, yes, we want to address that, but we want to feel authentic in doing it. And I'm like, you're actually using this as a rhetorical point that in essence allows you to do what it, it actually is used for your comfort. Like if you want to be and feel authentic, it means you want it to feel aligned with how you already identify. But I'm actually asking you to do something that's really challenging. It's not going to feel comfortable at first. So I, and a lot of my JTS colleagues make fun of me for it. I am on a mission for us to get rid of the word authentic when referring to human beings. We're gonna change and we need to have the space um, to change and to change our minds and to step into roles that feel a little weird and a little hard at first, but guess what? They're actually good for us. Mm. Yeah, I think that you just brought up um, something that I tell my students all the time, which is if it, if it doesn't feel challenging, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> like, um, you know, these, it should be hard. These conversations are difficult. And, you know, I really like uh, what Rabbi Azama brought up this idea that like, you know, if you have this sense of, of yourself as like a social justice warrior or whatever, like with no biases and no prejudices, then, then you can't do the work that needs to be done. You have, it require, this work requires a kind of vulnerability. It requires a kind of humility. It requires being able to recognize that you might be Pharaoh in a situation. And if you are not willing to do that work, then, then everything that you're doing is performative, right? It's, it's not going to be meaningful. Um, I, I often say, if it feels too easy, it can't be meaningful. Um, so I think that that will bring us to what to what I'm guessing based on the pacing of our conversation might be our, our last difficult question. Um, and relates, I think, actually to, to, to something that Rabbi Rishon just brought up, that the struggle for, for liberation is really the foundational story of the Jewish people and a cornerstone of, of much of Jewish identity. Um, intersectionality and arguably our Torah calls for us to recognize overlapping and interlocking nature of oppression and to acknowledge that no one is free until all of us are free, which is actually bringing up some art, what my little poster says right here in Hebrew and English. Um, 
And I would like to think about how you understand intersectionality and the struggle for liberation in, your, in the current moment. Um, how have you experienced this as a source of resonance or tension in your Jewish communities? And maybe this is a good space to speak particularly from um, either your own denominations or worldviews or the, the denominations that you caucus with. I like to say I'm not conservative, but I caucus with the conservatives. Um, I'll just say, speaking personally, I often feel this tension around my commitment to justice for Palestinians, which many in my own Jewish communities seem to find incompatible with my commitment to Jewish identity. I don't know if there are other issues that you might speak to from within your own communities um, where you feel as though your commitments might be seen as, as suspect or challenging, particularly because you are maybe already seen as a bit of an, of an outsider. Another sigh, there's a lot of sighing in this conversation. Rabbi Goldstein, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we play it like that. Um, you know, so actually, I was thinking about what you you said a few minutes ago um, about right, race is a Jewish issue. Stop and frisk is a Jewish issue, um, and you know, just the the nature of those those intersectional identities, also meaning that. I mean, I guess, here, let me stop and, uh, right, King, actually, Martin Luther King said it much better than I can, right? Like, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, right? So it's not just enough to fight anti-Semitism or to fight racism. It actually doesn't matter, really, if any Jew is experiencing an oppression or not. We have a responsibility to fight oppression in the many forms that it exists in, Um I do a lot of work, you know, with college students around, you know, we have like LGB Torah, a lot of stuff about the intersection of queer and Jewish identity, which I think is, is really powerful. Um, and if I'm not doing, you know, the same level of commitment to justice around my Black Jewish students as I am to my transgender students, I'm, I'm dropping the ball on something really important. So I think just uh, remembering that really we can't make any progress on any of the oppressions unless we're working towards something holistic that that I think addresses everybody's oppressions. Yeah, I, I feel that intersectionality really is a gift. Um, it is interesting to see the ways in which it is uh, poo-pooed uh, these days as like, oh, it's gone too far. But at least for me, I know that when I entered college uh, at Oberlin, it, it just kind of like changed my world for the better. This, so I came from a particular faith experience where there was one way to read the Bible and we had the right way. We could let people believe that they have the right interpretation, but, but we know we really have the right interpretation. Um, and so to step into deeper into Jewish community and into Jewish interpretation and to even look at just a, like at Midrash where you're reading through a Midrash and it'll say Devar Acher, another interpretation, another interpretation, another interpretation of the exact same, um, you know, the exact same piece of scripture. I found that really liberating. And it also is kind of a model for intersectionality where I can have my reading of a text, my reading of a situation, but it also requires me to have enough humility to acknowledge there is probably an experience that I do not understand because it's not my positionality. So I need to sit back and actually be open to other interpretations of Torah um, and what they have to teach me and teach me about my blind spots. So I find intersectionality to be exceedingly helpful. And um, also in thinking about like, some of the things that are really challenging um, about this. Yeah, I, I honestly do think that questions around Israel and Palestine um, are really, really challenging for me. I mean, as someone who's lived in Jerusalem for about two and a half years. And so, um, and yet one of the, one of my favorite learnings from one of my teachers who happens to be a very, an older, you know, Zionist male uh, who teaches philosophy was, 
he actually looked to the work of Yehuda Halevi, um, so medieval philosopher, among other things, um, in order to point to here is a Jewish thinker in the past who was thinking about Jews' responsibility because eventually a time would come when Jews would have power. And it's like to read like a middle, a, a Jewish philosopher from the middle ages imagining Jews having power and what kind of responsibility comes with that power. And, the, and this professor mapped it onto questions of Israel and Palestine. I found that to be one, incredibly intellectually honest. Two, it was moving and let me know it's okay to engage in these conversations. And three, for people who are trying to say, we can't have these conversations. It's like, well, our ancestors did it. So why can't we actually go and have some of these harder conversations and see if we can um, learn from it and if it can lead to mutual flourishing and um, you know, getting everybody free. But Black Lives Matter is anti-Zionist. <sighs> Now let me talk about that for a second. <laughs> Please, Rabbi. BLM is anti-Zionist. I don't so so that that sort of presumes the conceit that if something is not a hundred percent, you know, in your corner and support of you, that you shouldn't be a part of it, right? So you're saying to Black Jews, you shouldn't be part of Black Lives Matter because it's anti-Zionist, assuming that Zionism is part of your Jewish identity. So then why, by extension, am I expected to show up as Jewish a hundred percent in Jewish spaces? when likewise, my racial identity is under more egregious attack, I would say. So that's an entirely disingenuous conversation to say, just say you feel like weird around the loud black people. Just, that's, that's more honest, that's more honest. Just say that. Like the entire, when the movement for black lives came out with their platform, uh, of which like a fraction, like three sentences, maybe out of the entire manifesto mentioned Israel as an example of a separate unrelated you know, tenant, and all like the mainstream Jewish organizations came out to say, we are not, we're going to essentially continue not showing up for Black Lives Matter, but for this reason. Well, you weren't there before. So what are you, what are you saying? What are you, what are you showing up for? Um, when it comes specifically to intersectionality, I think I have a complicated relationship with it. I think it, there's, you know, good aspects and sort of bad aspects, like um, in sort of the, less rosy version of intersectionality. It can cause people to be hyper aware of their identities and spaces and intentionally sort of diminish themselves. Um, I can speak to that as, you know, an Orthodox Jew who's, you know, uh, who caucuses with the left right? <laughs> in liberal spaces, but in leftist liberal spaces is not necessarily a, a space or priority for like halakha or things like that. And I remember specifically, uh, I was at Isabella Friedman for a lefty Shabbaton and it was for Friday Night Kiddush. And I felt like weird and embarrassed to ask if there was like kosher wine available for Kiddush. And then I was like, what, what the hell are you doing? Why are you feeling embarrassed that you need to ask for your Jewish thing to be equally Jewish in this space that you're allowing and accepting other people's Jewishes to be Jewish in their space. And so that was sort of a personal uh, realization for me that uh, you don't have to be the loudest voice in the room, but you still get to have a voice in the room the same, you know, weight and sort of volume as everyone else. Um, on the other side of, of intersectionality, um, like for example, I'm writing a Torah com commentary right now. And as part of the introduction, I say this isn't, you know, it's not a black commentary, you know, it's not written specifically by an African-American rabbi speaking to how specifically the verses speak to us as Jews of the various African diasporas, right? It's also not a feminist, uh, commentary. It's also not an LGBTQ forward uh, commentary. Why? Because all these things are constantly sort of put into these sequestered places. So it's going to take all of those viewpoints and interweave them alongside sort of the traditional viewpoints that we're used to because they are all part of the same whole. So when you look at it in sort of that sort of uh, space, then I'm not sure how much a space intersectionality has for that because it sort of lends itself to the uh, fragmentization. It's like the conundrum of Black History Month or Women's History Month. Like we have these months because historically the contributions of these groups have been you know, erased or belittled. And so we have Black and Women's History Month that eventually we don't have to have Black and Women's History Month because it's all just American history. But until we're to that point, we have Black and you know, Women's History Month. So 
and think of the exact tech in writing this commentary to like have this all side by side in dialogue with each other in the same space, not having to go here for this part, there for that part. And so if we're going to navigate through intersectionality to also keep that in the back of our heads too, the back of our minds. So this isn't the end all be all. It's not to say, oh, these are all my, how my different pieces come together. It's for us all to acknowledge the wholeness of each other and not have to sort of. I think that you brought that together beautifully with sort of the, the theme of this panel in the sense that um, I think that like, even when I wanted you all to sort of introduce yourself in the way that with the information that you wanted the, the audience to know about you, it was the sense that we can't be reduced to these uh, individual labels, yet these individual labels together all do kind of intersect to inform at least part of how we experience the world. I think part of the issue is that it's never just these individual labels, right? Everybody always has you know, multipliers upon multipliers. There's no black, Jewish, queer, vegan women's history month. Um, so um, I would love for that month yeah. just for me, like, and, like three other time? people. <laughs> um, I, I want a month with 31 days. No. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think that that also uh, gets to a question that has come up and up a, that has come up again and again in the chat, um, and which I feel like we've kind of skirted around throughout this conversation, and which really was the reason for this conversation, which is, do you ever feel like you're, and this is, I think, Alana's attempt to put all of these many, uh, many versions of the same question together. Do you ever feel like you're wearing one hat or the other, Black or Jewish, or do you always have a lens that incorporates both of them, you know, this panel is called black, but, and, or Jewish. Um, but, you know, we're always all of these things all at the same time. So I think that the question people are asking is kind of how can we experience these identities all at once? And I think part of the reason for the panel is really thinking about how can we make it, how can we make build a world uh, where it isn't just about these labels, but where you can kind of sit at a table and bring all of yourself to that table. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end on that very easy to answer question. What do you want people to Who's see? What do you want people this? to know about being black and Jewish? I'll hop in. I'll hop in. I'll, I'll give I'll give everyone else a chance to collect their thoughts. I'll throw myself on the sword here. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's uh, an outgrowth of a question that all of us have heard some variation of in our careers or professional spaces. Like, are you more black or are you more Jewish? Are you Jewish first or black first? And I always respond to that with that makes as much sense as asking the color purple. Are you red first or are you blue first? It's purple. There are aspects of it that it shares with the color red. There's aspects that it shares with the color blue but it's purple. I'm, I don't wake up red on Monday and I'm blue on Tuesday and I'm you know, red again on Wednesday and purple on I'm purple all the time. And that's just how sort of we navigate there. It's not a, again, it's not that compartmentalization that we were just talking about. It's just our holistic way of how we go through the world. It's like, if I ask how, how is it like being, you know, a black woman, but also an American woman? It's like, I'm both those things. I don't do things as an American woman and things like as a black woman. I do things as a black American woman. And so to sort of parse these identities in the same way, just because it seems uh, unimaginably monolithic that these two things should come together. Like you got peanut butter in my chocolate and chocolate in my peanut butter, but you're, it's really that simple for us sometimes. Kendall? So uh, apologies, I'm in New York and it is a cold day, so you might hear some radiator going off. Um, you know, it, if I'm being honest, um, and, and, and honestly, this might also speak to my particular um, background. So as someone who became Jewish as an adult um, from two very Southern, you know, Louisiana uh, people, uh, my mom from New Orleans, in fact, um, like I have to admit, I do, I code switch quite a bit. Um, and it is, but even before I was Jewish, that was just something that 
I did and something that in a lot of cases I felt that I needed to do, um, not necessarily in order to survive in the more literal sense, but in um, just a sense of like, I knew that I had dreams, visions of how I wanted to go about life and how I wanted to navigate it. And I learned fairly quickly when I was young that saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, just because I'm bringing in, you know, either some of my dad's Shreveport or my mom's New Orleans um, in a specific way would suddenly set someone off and be like, I don't know what to do with that. And so I would say that it's something that I've carried into my Jewishness. Um, so when I'm thinking about being at JTS, um, I have wonderful colleagues at JTS and I have wonderful professors and teachers there. I still only bring about 60% of myself. Um, and that's the way it is. Um, that being said, in spaces with Jews of color, um, a lot more of me comes out. Like um, I tend to write a Torah blog for um, Amu, the Jews of Color Torah Academy, where if you look through some of them, you will see um, you know, quotes of Beyonce right next to the Parshat HaShavua. Um, you'll see um, different like gifts show up or even just some things that are just very creative. And that is just an example of me bringing in even more of myself um, that honestly doesn't is not always welcome in um, certain mainstream or legacy spaces. So uh, and it's just a reality for me, um, but that's also a reality that draws a lot from my particular background. And yeah. Rabbi Aizama, you'll have the last word tonight. I, I also do uh, a, probably a ridiculous amount of code switching. So I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Uh, you know, and that's not, not hold, like they're still holding all of the identities at once, but knowing that some of the identities are going to be, um, you know, able to translate and speak more to the languages of the folks that you're speaking with in some spaces and, and others, not so much. Um, but I think, you know, for me, really, honestly, uh, it's still, it's still a question. I'm, I'm, I'm a young rabbi, I'm a, I'm a young person. And I think it can be hard growing up with so many intersectional identities. Uh, I know like as a queer person, it took me a very long time to come out uh, because I was like, I'm already black and Jewish and I have too many intersectional identities. And, like I can't be one more thing. Um, actually, my mother is clearly watching this and just texted me to tell you that uh, Rabbi Rishon, when I was younger, she suggested many times that I marry you before I came out. So you were, you were her icon of what a, what a black Jew what a good black Jewish husband would look like, um, you know. But I think uh, there's there's an element of of just still trying to find that authentic space and that being okay. And I think a lot of people that hold a lot of intersectional identities change over time and it's fluid and you just you know it's okay to not know kind of what Kendall said right like that authentic authenticity piece doesn't have to look the same at any moment. So and. Thank Fine. you. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. Um, on that note, I think we are going to have to, to end tonight's festivities. I would love for us to be able to be purple all the time in all of the environments that we exist in. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe next year. Next year, we can all be purple in Jerusalem, um, a free and liberated Jerusalem where everybody gets all of their self-determined rights. Um, all right, so <laughs> uh, I'll toss it off to you. Claim it. Claim it. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Maneri and all of the panelists so much for being here with us tonight. Um, and for the participants, for all of their questions and for listening with us. I encourage each of you to learn about the work that Rabbi Golchin Stoll and Kendall Pickney do uh, to promote education on Jewish diversity through organizations such as Amud and Bahá'u'lláh Lashon and Kaleidoscope Jews. Uh, and of course, to read more of Rabbi Rishon's work under his pen name, Manish Tana, with tablet, the foreword, Hevria, and of course, his novel, Ariel Samson, Freelance Rabbi which was a 2018 finalist in the National Jewish Book Awards Goldberg category uh, in the debut fiction. Um, 
I want to tell you that our next event is going to be on May 24th. Uh, it will be about the new Pew research about a portrait, portrait of American Jewry, which I hope there will be. I think we'll have more issues of diversity to discuss in that panel as well. Um, and please both follow Africana Studies and uh, the Grant Center um, on Instagram and Twitter, uh, Africana Tulane. I'll type into the box and you can find Grant Center to you. Thank you so much. And uh, this is recorded, so there will be a recording circulated afterwards if uh, you can stay. Thank you.